Uh, I would like to invite, uh, welcome you on the, one of the evenings of the Department for Education and Culture of the Jewish Museum in Prague. Uh, today we have a special guest from the New York City, Mr. Martin Kaufman, um, with his uh, special talk titled uh, The Maharal Variations. Uh, Mr. Kaufman uh, is involved in a number of educational programs and activities in New York City, but also uh, online, uh, all related uh, to the Jewish studies, uh, philosophy, mysticism, uh, or the topic of Bible movement. Now I will give the word to Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, everybody can you hear me okay? All right. If at any particular point you can't hear me, you're in luck. Well, first of all, I want, to thank, I want to thank this wonderful city for inviting me to be here, the Jewish Museum. And it's, it's just a, a, a remarkable honor uh, to be able to, to, to sit here and to learn Maharal together with you is, is something that I could only have uh, dreamt of. And I want to thank my friend, Dr. Mark Podwell, and all my friends at the, at the museum for, for all their, their wonderful encouragement and wonderful guidance and advice that they've given me in terms of, of the preparation uh, for, 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 the, for this evening. Um, the thought of the Maharal, who lies in our, in our midst right here, and I'm a little bit daunted when I, when I see that statue looking over me, almost to be saying, watch yourself, boy. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, is, um, uh, is certainly, is certainly a, a, a daunting task in, 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 any, in any way one looks at it. Uh, the great difficulty in, in, in studying and learning Ma Maharal is, is, is by definition the extensive nature of, of, of his writings. His, 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 the, the, the sheer volume of, of, of his work is, is, is absolutely mind-boggling. And he has con takes concepts and does not necessarily exhaust the topic in any one place. In fact, you can find the same idea that's spread out in seven, eight, nine, ten times, and even more throughout his writings. So in, in, in essence, in really to understand him and really to understand anything, you have to understand all of him, which is very, which is very, very difficult to do. I always thought that this, that this this really dovetails with part of his philosophy of education. You know, one of the things that Maharal spent a lot of time with in, in, in his career was what was a philosophy of education. It was very, very critical. Uh, we know of the educational methodologies of, of, of his time. You know, aside from the organized rabbinate, he had a great, great deal to say about, about uh, educational, pedagogical philosophy. And, and one of the things that is the hallmark of, of, of this philosophy is, is, is the emphasis that he places upon comprehensiveness. Comprehensiveness meaning the, 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 the need to master the broad topic. And, and in his day, that which he was very, very upset about, of course, is the way in which not only uh, uh, rabbis learned or didn't learn, but the way in which they taught students, which was, of course, to, to, uh, to, to spend so much time going into a particular topic to such a degree that the hair splitting never really got anywhere, and he was very, very upset about that. And, and I believe that his writings reflect that need for comprehensive. It's almost as if he's saying to you, fine, welcome, please come and sit down and study with me, but understand something, this is not going to be a, a, a passing type of fancy. It's going to be something that is really going to take you uh, a, a very, very long time and is going to um, uh, uh, require you to, to immerse yourself to be able to understand. As a result of that, uh, it, it's one of the difficulties that academics and whatever have had with him. Academics like to be able to, to, to put their hands around you know, pieces of, of knowledge that they can really sink their teeth into and really exhaust. Maharal is not one of those thinkers that lends itself to that type of, of approach. His, his, his productive output in all aspects is, is absolutely enormous. As a Talmudist and a legal decisor of Posek, as we call it, he left behind very, very little. 
Very, very little indeed. We do have some, some, some legal uh, uh, opinions of his, true vote and so forth, whatever, but this is not really where he has left us in terms of posterity. Yeah, we know that he was uh, uh, esteemed, of course, as a great Talmudic and, and legal scholar. You know, the, 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 the way in which he is, the, the, is held in terms of discussion about him is, is, you know, is, is, is near mythical in terms of, 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 of the respect. His real work and that which he really has left this, this voluminous body of material is in the area of, of, of what we call Jewish theology, philosophy, and, and Kabbalah, in the area of, of what I call philosophy, okay, he covers a, an enormous array of material, everything from moral, ethical philosophy, socio-political philosophy, linguistics, the philosophy of linguistics, which certainly in, 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 in his way actually foreshadows the development of linguistics with somebody like Wittgenstein, his philosophy of history and the dialectical uh, 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 method that he, that he employs certainly is something that foreshadows the development of same within Hegel, within Hegel's thought a, a, a century and a half uh, uh, after him. And then of course he has this philosophy of education which, which runs throughout uh, uh, many of, 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 his, of his writings. Just from the description that, that, that I've given you, you see that there is an incredible emphasis on humanism in terms of his thought. He is really the writer of, of, of humanism. He places man front and center in terms of, 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 his, of, of his focus. Beyond that, we know that he is a, he's a great mystic, a great Kabbalistic thinker who, who, who does something quite remarkable in terms of that Kabbalistic thought in the sense that he takes you know, these Kabbalistic ideas, Kabbalistic concepts, and then he turns them, he uses a philosophic idiom in order to express these, the, these Kabbalistic ideas, which, which makes it, from his point of view, easier to understand what it is that he's talking about, but on the other hand, you're not always sure that you're really getting at the point that he's, that, that he's talking about. Anyway, that's not the point this evening anyway. He's a great biblical exegete. Uh, his Gurarya composition on, on, on Rashi, super commentary on Rashi, is, is to this day something which is uh, remarkably and intensively studied. And of course, we know here of him as a, as, as a great communal leader and spokes, spokesman as well as an academic head. Now, tonight, what we want to focus on uh, uh, very specifically is the area that uh, absorbed uh, Maharal in, in his lifetime in terms of his academic writings, which is the area of Agada. Agada, Agada uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to, to put it very inexact, but nevertheless to get an idea, is that body of, of, of Talmud, particularly as well as Midrash, that we would call, would call it, it's, it's folkloric in nature. It's rabbinic literature of a, of a folkloric, the stories, uh, a mythology, legends, those type of things. And, and those were the, 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 the stuff of particular interest to, to Maharal. In fact, the vast majority of all of his writing deals with the issue of explicating, explaining to us agada, rabbinic agada. Now, this, this body of thought known as Agadah, this literature that we're talking about, is very, very uh, controversial, not only in terms of the outside world, which we'll discuss in one moment, but in terms of the Jewish world itself. And in his work, Ber, Ber Hagalah, which is the well of redemption, the well of exile, depending upon uh, how you want to, 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 to translate these, these, uh, uh, this word of it, he, 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 ga he engages in an extended polemic against a scholar uh, of the 16th century called Azari de Rossi, who is writing from Mantua. He lives in Mantua, and he is a, he is a fine scholar, there's no question about that, who is, who is particularly of a, of a rationalistic type of bent in terms of, 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 of his thought. And Azari de Rossi uh, launches on a major, a major uh, a criticism of rabbinic, uh, of rabbinic Agadah, this particular literature. 
This, the, this material is, 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 is limited. It, it's not very, very rational. It flies against the spirit of the time. Uh, uh, in other words, the rationalism of the, of, of the Renaissance. And as a result, it's something which should be de-emphasized and not something which should be that much of the, uh, 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 that much the subject of, of study. And besides that, it makes us as Jews look bad in the eyes of, 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 of our Christian neighbors. It's, it's this irrational mythology, and it doesn't look good. And here we are, we're studying this stuff, and it is, uh, it is a problem. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that the Be'er Gola, which, which Maharal pens in the 1580s or something of that sort, depending upon when it was actually published, is ostensibly, again, a, 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 a counterattack against the Zarya de Rossi's criticism of Agatic literature. But... Maharal knew very, very well that all of his writings okay, was, was going to be analyzed, subjected to scrutiny by the church in one form or another. The church scholars, the church censors were, were, were certainly going to be looking at everything that he was going to write. And Maharal knew that very, very, very well. So in, in a sense, what Maharal is doing is that he is lobbing these grenades against the Zarya de Rossi, his, his co-religionist in Mantua, when in essence what he's doing is that he is he's talking to the church. He's explaining to the church what they do not understand, which is typical of Maharal. The boldness of a, of a thinker such as Maharal is not afraid of, of anybody, of any time, and of course, and certainly not, 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 not the church. Now understand something. I go back, we'll go back a couple centuries on this. The church had been engaged in a, a, a particularly uh, a vehement attack on the Talmud. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the Talmud has held a fascination in the eyes of the, ch of the church for centuries. Aside from the fact that they, that, that, that they uh, uh, want to um, argue with the Jews about what the Talmud means, they love to burn the Talmud, whatever. And the answer is, question is why? What is it that really bothers the church so much about the Talmud? And, they, and the answer is in two parts as follows. Is number one, the, 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 the 60, 65% you know, rationalistic legalism of the Talmud, the extreme logic of the Talmud and, uh, and, and, and the argumentation that's involved with it renders the student, the study, the studier, the scholar impervious to the, the attempts at conversion. Are you going to go ahead and argue against a Jewish scholar about, uh, about theology or something of that sort? These people do this day and night. There's no way that you're going to be able to succeed with something of that sort. On the other hand, this agatic material, this agatic material, this folkloric, legendary, mythological type of stuff, which in fact appeals to the less educated elements within the Jewish community, okay, renders that part of the community also somewhat impervious to conversions, whatever, because the church, the church believes that, that the stupidity of this legendary material Okay, retards the intellectual development of this part of the Jewish community, and therefore they really are not susceptible to the conversion efforts. So on both sides of it, the church is very, very upset with the Talmud. So they, they go ahead and they burn it down. Of course, after in fact the printing press, you know, is invented, the idea of burning the Talmud is really not as much fun as it used to be. Because the fact is, go burn the Talmud, we'll just go ahead and have a, you know, another hundred of them printed somewhere else. So you don't go ahead and, and to do that. So the problem with this is, in 15, around 1553, I believe, is, the, is deemed to be the time of the, uh, the beginning of the Counter-Reformation. Re uh, and, uh, of course, the church is regaining its ascending and picking up its pace again in terms of, of censoring and thought control and all of those kinds of things. And the Maharal is, 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 is writing his, these writings to basically counter the, the attack of the church as well as the rationalistic, the over-rationalistic uh, 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 thrust of, of that which exists within the Jewish community as well. It's one of the reasons why he spends so much of, of, of his life 
writing and dealing with um, uh, uh, the, the Agadah. I call this, the, the, this lecture the, the variations, because variations, of course, in, in, in music you know, is, is, a, is a basic theme, which then goes ahead in, in the hands of a, of a good composer, is developed in many different ways, you know, either in terms of changes in melody or in rhythm or in structure and, and all of those types of things. And Maharal, in the last part of Bergola, engages in what I call his variations. He takes 18, you know, very, very far-fetched, very, very far-fetched rabbinic legends, okay, and in one form or another, subjects each one of them to variations in terms of analysis. One of them will be more philological. He'll go ahead and he'll concentrate much more on the, the language to show the depth of the language and therefore unco uncovering the meaning of the rabbis by means of going ahead and discovering the depth of language. In other parts, he goes and shows that these philosophic concepts are being portrayed by means of different types of images and pictures and so on and so forth. These are the variations that we're talking about. We're going to analyze one of these variations uh, this, this evening. Before we go ahead and do that, and this is one of the, you know, the, great, the, great, uh, the great honors that I have, is, is, is to be able to try to encapsulate some of, of, of Maharal's thought, you know, in other words, some of the principles that he has within, that he uses over and over and again in terms of his writing, and a lot of these, again, are Kabbalistic in nature, although, as I said beforehand, expressed in a, in, in, in a philosophic idiom. And one of the things that's very, very important to, 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 to understand about Kabbalah is that it, it is that part, it, 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 it is that part of, of our Masorah, of our tradition that, 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 that lends itself so much to interpretive creativity. The great professor Gershom Sholem, for example, spends a lot of times in his writings talking about this interpretive creativity that is at the heart of, 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 of Kabbalah. And according to Shalom, Shalom says that over and over again, the rabbis in one form or another take this license that they have in terms of interpretation and attribute it to what is referred to as the Tzalem Elohim, the image of God. The image of God in one form or another, according to the Kabbalist, is the imaginative faculty. Contrary to Maimonides, Maimonides, who interprets in the first chapter of the Guide of the Perplexed the, the, the image of God as being the intellect, as being the intellect, in the sense, as Maimonides says, is uh, just like, just like the intellect, which is completely incorporeal, completely non-physical, and it is not dependent upon any physical machinery within the human body, nevertheless impacts the physical, such is the way that we can begin to even think about the divine as being this incorporeal power, this incorporeal uh, uh, being that impacts the physical. And that's how Maimonides looks at something like the image of God, not so the Kabbalist. The Kabbalist says, yeah, 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 that's good. That's very, very nice, we like that. But there's much more over here that really at the end of the day, the image of God and by the way, Maharal has about seven or eight different interpretations about image of God throughout his writing. So I don't want to go and say that this is the final word that he has as far as image of God goes. That's certainly not right. But in terms of a Kabbalistic thrust towards imaginative, interpretive creativity, this is rooted in what we would call the image of God. The idea of creation, of creativity, mimicking the creativity of the creator. That is the image of, of, of God par excellence. And this is something that Maharal really likes. He likes this idea quite a bit and works with this extensively throughout his, his, his writings. Very interestingly, we have one of the great influences upon uh, 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 Maharal. There's actually, you know, two of the great influences, believe it or not, is, Ma is Maimonides being a very, very powerful 
uh, influence upon uh, upon Amara, but also Nachman is Ramban uh, of of the 13th century. You know, Spain, great Kabbalist, great Talmudist as well, is a great influence upon him. Exerts enormous amount of influence, and Nachmanides in 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 his Kabbalah is rooted in the Provencal, the medieval Provencal thought, and particularly that of, of Isaac the Blind, who is the son of, of, of uh, Abraham ben David. I mean, you can go and take a look at that at a later point. By the way, I'm going to write up a summary of this, of this talk. So, so anything that you, don't, that you miss, if there's anything, and it's very unlikely that you're going to miss anything over here, I will go ahead and summarize that and, uh, and put it across to you. And then, of course, if there's something that I miss in my summary, you'll please let me know, and then I'll be able to fill in the, uh, the, the, the parts later on. This way we'll be able to develop a, uh, a back and forth between them. But in the, the, the Provencal Kabbalah, particularly, in, in the Sefer Yitzir, which is one of the building blocks of Kabbalah, even before the Zohar is, 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 is becomes popularized, in Isaac the Blinds, he says the following, gives an exhortation. He says, investigate, contemplate the Svirot. The Svirot being this, this spiritual superstructure that emanates of the divine via which all of the divine energy and life is actually you know, transported you know, to, to this world. And then he goes ahead and says, you have to take a look at the Svirot. You have to imagine what they are. You have to picture what they are and translate those pictures and those images that your mind creates into actual concepts. Or the other way around, take the concept of the Svirot and translate them into pictures. Basically what I, I would call fundamentally an artistic exercise, an artistic endeavor. Now, as we move along in, in terms of Amara, before we get to this particular Agadah that we want to talk about, I want to also lay down three basic premises in Maharal's thought that is absolutely essential for, for understanding it. Number one, man is the centerpiece of creation. The objective, the purpose of creation is man. Everything that exists within creation is ultimately either to serve or to further the development of man. It's not just Maharal, this isn't Kabbalah in general. Number two, Maharal has what I would call a pantheistic notion of, of, of creation. In other words, that the creator is very much suffused, is, is disseminated throughout all of his creation. He doesn't create and stand back in any kind of transcendent way, but is very, very much part and parcel of his creation in a very intimate type of way. And number three, I would want to go ahead and, and just discuss for a moment his concept of man. What is key to Maharal and Kabbalists in general is not so much the intellect, that's almost a given. Yes, we know man is the creature that has the intellect. But man has within him the soul. And the soul is mamash, is 100% a part and parcel of the divine above. So man has within him, imparted within him, as, is, as it states in, in, in the verse, in the creation of man, the pach ba'apav, nishmas chayim, and God blows into his nostrils the breath of life. And Nachmanides, Ramban, says on this point, this is the only thing in all of creation that is not created. doesn't say anything about creation. It says that God places it into, in, into man. And it is 100% part and parcel of the divine. So man has within him, within him, part of the divine. So man has within him an aspect of the infinite of the infinite divine. For Maharal, this manifests itself very, very specifically in terms of the way that he sees man. If you would ask Maharal, how do you see man? What is man? How do you define man? He would say, because of that soul, man is the being that has infinite potential. Infinite potential. Infinite. Man is not limited at any point in, in his existence in terms of how far he can go. 
that that soul that he has because of its infinite aspect of it enables man to continuously progress throughout all of his existence he's not bounded even by his intellect he's able to go beyond that and this is very very important because ultimately this is this is, this is critical in terms of understanding his philosophy man connects to god not by the intellect so much as much more by the soul because it's like with like it's 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 the it's it's the soul returning and connecting to 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 its base it's exactly the same thing so for maharal he would say the following is that man is 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 this being because of that soul that is no longer truly part of the created world there is an aspect of man that is created it is material it is finite on the other hand because of that soul man is that being who actually rises above that in in essence completely rises above it not quite divine but no longer of the animal kingdom whatsoever he exists in some type of an in-between spot as far as the world is concerned and that becomes the challenge that Maharal sees in terms of, of, of man is that man has this grandeur has this possibility has this this capability to continuously rise and rise and rise again fitting into this this, this very powerful humanism that Maharal has has within him man is that being that 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 has that infinite pot infinite potential in terms of, of of his development now let's go to to the to, to, to the agada I don't want to go ahead and hold you longer than than I promised because they said there's going to be like a hook that's going to come pull me out at five at you didn't say joke. that it was a joke I didn't I don't speak the language so I thought that's what you meant okay excuse me I'm going to do it. now in the Bergola, I'm going to go ahead and explain this. I'm going to go ahead and distill this and I'm going to explain it because I want to really be able to, 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 to show something that Maharal does. He quotes an Agadah from the Talmud in Brachot and, uh, on uh, 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 page um, 6, folio side uh, A. And it's the following, is that the rabbis ask a very curious question. From where do we know? How do we know that God prays. Very interesting. God prays. Very nice idea. And anyway, it says, well, we know it from this particular verse. It says, quoting the prophet Isaiah, and I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So the rabbi said, ah, you see, God's always saying, it's my house of prayer. It's my, my, my altar, all of that. Therefore, we see that God prays. Ah, so the Talmud says, all right, well, if God prays, what is his prayer? What is his prayer they want to know? So God's prayer is this. May it be the will before me that my mercy overwhelm, conquer my wrath, my anger. May my mercy overcome my strict, stern attributes that my conduct towards my children be with the quality of mercy extending beyond the boundary of judgment. That is the Agadah. Well, Azaria de Rossi, in his book, Mayor and Nine, goes ahead and says, ridiculous. What a ridiculous notion that is. You know, there, there's none other but God, the creator of everything. So to whom is God praying? I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. God's power extends over all, over everything. What need has he of prayer? What need has he of anything or anyone outside of himself? And therefore, prayer is an anomaly vis-a-vis -vis the Creator. Now, Maharal immediately comes at this particular point, not at this particular point, at the beginning of, these, of the variations, as he is going and describing what he's going to do to Azari de Rossi. Okay. 
Maharal goes ahead and says, well, this guy doesn't really know anything. He doesn't know anything. Because at the end of the day, he says, I'm learning. I've learned my entire approach to, to Agada, to this entire field, from, from Maimonides. Maimonides himself, in his writings, in the Guide of the Perplexed, tells us, teaches us how to look at this field of Agadic literature. As he says, as Maharal says, and behold, the great teacher who was filled with wisdom and knowledge as the ocean in all fields, whether natural sciences, theology, derived wisdoms, he opened a gate into the field of rabbinic thought for us to show that all their words, all their words are precious and pillars of wisdom. And due to the enormity of the subject material, Maimonides only addressed this literature in generalities within his works, the guide, the commentary on the Mishnah, and so forth. And as a result of that, he has left a lot of room for us to fill in. And there are those who believe that ultimately what, what, what Maharal was, was attempting to do with this extensive work that he did in the area of Agadah was actually to complete the overall uh, 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 effort of Maimonides in terms of explicating all of Jewish law and all of Jewish thought, which he didn't do, which would be a very, very interesting thing to, to, to understand. So the issues before us are as follows. God prays, the notion of tefillah, prayer, the Hebrew word of prayer. God prays, the notion of tefillah. God wants to have his attribute of mercy, chesed, chesed, kindness, overwhelm his attribute of din, of stern judgment. He wants to bring his people to the house, to the bayit, the house of, of, of his prayer, in order that they should go ahead and, and worship together with him. What, what does this, this, this mean? And, and, I'm, and I'm going to distill that which Ma Maharal goes on for some time to explain as, as, as follows. He says that tefillah, prayer, you think of it as sitting there and going like this. Maharal says that no, tefillah is a contemplative, meditative state which distills and reaches the essence of the prayer. In man, in man, the concept of prayer is that it strips away his materiality and lays bare the element of man which is his essence. Which is the, what is the essence of man according to Maharal? Soul. The soul. The soul. The result of intense contemplation is man becoming his essential self. Pure spirituality. And that spirituality, when it is laid bare, when the soul is laid bare, connects to the divine. It connects to the realm of the infinite, to the realm of infinite potential and infinite possibility. Okay, that's as far as man is concerned. What does prayer mean in terms of, of, of God? He says as follows, is that vis-a-vis -vis God, as a contemplative state, as a contemplative state, is a description of God's internal accessing of his continuous, infinite, primordial will. The will which is always there. On God, in God's part. It's not something which stops, but which is all, always there. The primordial will that we're talking about, as far as Maharal is concerned, is the original impetus in motivation to create. To create. The move from absolute nothing to something, i.e. creation. The terminology that he uses to express this, and that is, is used in Kabbalah, is the term called chesed. Chesed means kindness, generosity. But in terms of Kabbalah, it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is that it indicates an external thrust on the part of the divine. 
Chesed, kindness, generosity, is something which you, which you show, which you bestow upon something other than yourself. So therefore, it is an externally oriented attribute. Similarly, as far as the creator is concerned, the concept of, of chesed is this externally oriented thrust as far as the creator is concerned. Maharal says that is the impetus in creation. That is the actualization of the potential within the, the divine. Before there is creation, there is nothing except the infinite oneness of God. The actualization of the attributes from their potential to actual is the move of chesed. In essence, it goes right to the heart of the essential nature of the divine. For Maharal, the attribute par excellence is the attribute of creation. From man's point of view, that is us. Without that attribute, there's nothing. We cannot begin to think of anything aside from this attribute in terms of its essential nature. Maharal calls this externally oriented attribute of God, this chesed, essence. He calls it the essence of the divine. The impulse to create, the will and desire to allow something other than self to be. The actualization of this attribute of chesed is infinite, as is the essence of the divine. It always strives for actualization, to create, to pour more of itself into his creation. It's not something which turns on and off. It is always there. It's always going and it's always in activity. The problem is, is that creation remains finite. It's limited. There's only so much of this divine energy, this divine life, that anything in creation is able to absorb. And the infinite aspect of the divine, of this attribute, has to be restrained. That is called in Kabbalah, din, judgment, sternness, boundary. Said that's what judgment actually is. It's defining boundary, defining lim limitation, control, uh, 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 making sure that something stays within a pre uh, prescribed boundary is what is called din. So the point of the matter is, is that the attribute of din exists in dialectical opposition to the attribute of chesed. You have this infinite impulse to create that has to be curbed because the creation is not capable of absorbing this infinite attribute. Nevertheless, the will on the part of the creator is always there, is always there, but is curbed by the attribute of din, of judgment, of sternness, which, which, which stops it from overloading the system. It's almost like you would have an electric motor that is only able to accept a certain amount of voltage it would go ahead and burn out if it would have more that was placed into it. So that is what is called in Kabbalah the din, the, the, the constraint, the judgment. So now Maharal goes back and explains this is God's prayer. The primordial will which exists in the creator is effectively the continuously actualized to be itself, to achieve its essence. In the, in, in the pouring forth and the bestowing of this energy, of this divine life into its creation. It wants to overcome the restraint, the din. It wants to seek continued, continued actualization, but it can't do that because it is limited. So therefore, it's contemplative prayer, as it were, it's meditation, is that it wants to continue to give, to pour, to give, to pour over there, but it's, can't, it's limited. There's only one way in which this, this restraint is overcome. And that is if the creation is able in some form or another to expand, to be able to receive more of this divine energy, vitality, and life. But how is it able to? It's finite. So how is it able to? 
The answer is through man. Because man has the capability via its soul to continuously expand, to continuously expand its potential, to continually expand its being. Man has the capability of effectively rising up to, the, to this divine notion of overcoming its limitation in order to expand. It's almost a kind of notion that exists in modern physics of the expansion of the universe, that the universe is continuously in a state of, of, of expansion. For Maharal, you would say, well, that's right, but that expansion doesn't take place via the material aspect of the universe, but it takes place via the, the, the spiritual development of, of man that is able to accept more and more and more of this divine uh, uh, vitality. So that is the prayer. The prayer means that's essence. That goes to the essence. The essence of God in terms of his attributes is this notion of the creative attribute of, of chesed. It wants to overcome all boundaries, but it's limited to. It's dependent, as it were, upon man. Basically, God's prayer is that man seeks effectively higher and higher levels of his own development in order to effectively allow God to continually to self-actualize into a greater and greater extent. So over here, in this agada, in this, in this lesson that Maharal learns, he's saying is that, you know, my house is that I want to bring my children to my house, to the, to the house of my prayer to the house where my altar goes. The house of God, in this particular lesson, according to Maharal, is his creation. The creation is the house. But again, the epicenter, the, the objective, the centerpiece of all the creation, of course, is man. So effectively, the house in this particular agada for Maharal is man. The house of my prayer, Maharal says, is man is man. God is, as it were, dependent upon man for the further self-actualization of his self. So, in essence over here, what happens is that Maharal, in his criticism of Azari ben de, uh, de, de Rossi, as well as the church letter, but let's leave it with Azari de Rossi for now, is basically looking at him and saying, is that, you know, your problem is like this. Aside from the fact that you don't really understand very, very much, your biggest issue is that you have no imagination. And that's bad, because it's not just because you don't have an imagination that makes you somewhat limited. According to Kabbalah, and according to the way that Maharal understands it, not having imagination means that you are lacking in terms of your Tzalem Elohim. Your image of God is defective. Your image of God is defective is quite, an, you know, quite a, a criticism. I don't know the last time you were told that, by the way, aside from not being very nice, your image of God is defective. It doesn't happen very often. Well, that's what he does with, 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 with the Zarya de Rossi. He says that that's exactly the problem with him. And the point of the matter is, is that for, for, for Maharal, Maharal's explaining over here is that this creative impulse, this creative impulse, impulse is at the heart of what it means to be human. In Kabbalah, in terms of its essence, what it does, it takes, it takes the concepts and converts them into symbols and then leaves us with the creative activity of taking those symbols, those pictures, those images, and then turning them back into concepts again which is exactly what in fact is going on, which ultimately speaking for Maharal is not just an exercise of theology, but it's, it's an artistic, creative type of, 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 of an activity. And that create, the creative activity of the artist, Maharal says, is truly divine, is truly imitative of the creator, because that impulse, that notion of the chesed, that attribute of the chesed, goes to the essence of the divine. Thank you very much. There you go. We have a few minutes for, 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 for questions. 
and uh, I would be very happy to, to, to try to, uh, uh, to, to, to answer any questions. Don't ask me hard questions, though. I would appreciate that. Yes, Mark. How much of, how much of the church's um, problem with the Talmud included passages such as that Jesus sits in boiling excrement? They, they didn't like that. Let me just say that. They, they didn't like it. And, and of course, that's, uh, that's something which is, which, is a, which is a focus. But, you know, understand something is that that was actually a, a, a more minor part of their, of their criticism. Because, you know, take a look at all these disputations that exist in 1240 in Paris, in 1263 in Barcelona. Without, the, the, the disputant on the part of the church is an apostate Jew who has the capability of arguing about the Talmud with them. They're, they're really interested in is getting at the ridiculousness of the agotic material, number one, which, which is a big part of the disputations, no question about that. And then, of course, they have the background to be able to, to, to stand equally with, with, with the rabbis as far as, as a, a legalistic uh, argumentation as well. But there's no question that they, they certainly put forth the, you know, these references, these anti-Christian references as well. In a kind of disputation, proposed disputation, the rabbi mocks the ridiculousness of Christ rising from the dead. That, that's, that, that's, there's no question about it. But here we see also is that you have, you have Maharal who's, who's mocking the ignorance of, 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 of a rabbi in Mantua for not understanding how to read a basic piece of rabbinic literature. In which he which he does you know you know quite re readily you know and that's uh, that that's 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 normal for, for for him to do that. Thank you, Great. sir. Good evening. You spoke about uh, uh, that Maral when he writes his writings he knows that it will go through the censorship and we know that it happened, uh, but. I, I know that uh, sometimes he writes very, very strongly against Christianity, specifically in some book which I uh, learned quite thoroughly, which is the uh, Drushala Mitzvot, where he speaks about the NSF and all this. And I didn't see any censorship in the first print, which was printed here in Prague. Yeah, well, well, that, well that's a very, very good point. I mean, he, at, certain, at certain levels, he feels somewhat immune. To the, to the criticism as well. He, he, he feels that he has protexia, you know, from, from, from the, the authorities here in Prague to be able to say certain things that might not be able to be said in Vienna or some other place of that sort. So your, your point is, is, is a good one because he does feel, you know, quite comfortable at being able to, to say what he wants to say, you know, whether in fact it's going to be Quietly, a veiled type of way, or or, or right, you know, right out in the Farish in, in explaining it the uh, uh, right upward. You're absolutely right, no doubt. Anybody else? This is your last chance. It's a rare opportunity. Only one question per person, then, please. <laughs> No, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just I like very much what you said. That what they did not like in the Talmud is that, on one hand, the intellectual part that you disturb them from converting the intellectual elite and the agadic part. This is a beautiful thing. Do you have any uh, proof to that? This is the reason why they wanted to better the Talmud all these times? Well, you, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, I, I, I'm not an historian. Okay, that's something that, that, that I'm not. But, but, but the fact of the, uh, you know, the, the point is, is, is that we know from, from, from the disputations that that's the thrust of their arguments. If they're on these, these two or three prong attacks, yes. So clearly they are looking at agada differently than they are looking at halakha. Or, or they're looking at the criticism of, of Christianity itself, that they're looking at different prongs as far as their uh, 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 fear of, of, of Talmud. In some form or fashion, they look at the Talmud and says, 
It is a protective membrane that insulates the Jew from conversion. I just have a very short comment. You spoke about the church. There was nothing like the church in those days because, you know, here was Protestantism and Catholicism. And we should take this really under our consideration because, of course, uh, the early Protestants that influenced the folk here uh, were in different way of thinking than the Catholic Church. So we would say the Catholic Church and not the Church. No, I said that. You know, yes, not, he's he's yes, not exactly. saying that. I'm saying this because, you know, in, in, in terms of what I'm looking at, the burning of, of, of the Talmud, in, in Paris or, in, or in, in the difficulties in Spain or whatever like that, that was the Catholic Church. Here it would be also the Catholic Church. Yes, also the Catholic Church as well as others. So I, I, I don't mean to, 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 to reserve all of my, uh, all of the comment for, for the Catholic Church. If you want to include the Protestant Church, I'm willing to do well, that. There are many Protestant churches. And there's many different types. That's exactly right. And Sorry. I just want to mention that in his time was another very interesting philosopher and thinker, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not Protestant. Uh, his uh, name is Comenius, or he's known under the name Comenius. Yes. And many, there are many similarities. Yes. And this is yes. interesting. It's fascinating. Yes. Particularly in his philosophy of education, he was very influenced exactly. by Comenius. Absolutely. You're, you're right. Very good point. No question. I think that, that one, one, of the, one, one of the great, you know, the great things about you know, Prague for a thinker like, like Maharal is that he had a, you know, a thinker with this type of a mind and his ability to absorb you know, so much as he did was able to, to come into contact with, 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 with different developing trends and different types of thought that really enabled him to push the contours of his own thought into many different directions that may not have been the case if he had remained in Poland. So therefore, you know, the environment here in Prague was a very, very positive one intellectually for, for Maharal. I agree with that. That's it? Thank you, thank you so much. That's wonderful. Der Chaim, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Very, very kind. Thank you. And thank you very, very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Beautiful.